Should I get the clicker? Oh, oh, sorry. Thank you. Yeah, hello everyone. It's, uh, I just flew in from Seattle this morning. And it's exciting to see the energy around ag tech in the Silicon Valley. I'll talk a little bit about my story. I've been at Microsoft for 15 years. Uh, my background is not in agriculture. Um, I did my PhD in computer science from Cornell University. I joined Microsoft Research in 2005. And I started this research in 2015. This is like a startup that we were running within, uh, within Microsoft. So going back to Dixon and Chuck's point, this is like a startup like research happening within a company for a sector. So as I was saying, my background is not in agriculture, but I did grow up in India. This is uh, uh, like it happens in Indian families. Some of you are from India, you'd relate to this. In the summer and winter vacations, you usually end up in your grandparents' place. And my grandparents used to live in this small farm in North Bihar. Bihar is like the poorest state in India. So growing up back there every summer and winter months, I would be up there four months a year, I would be spending in a village in, in India. Back then, I hated agriculture, anything to do with agriculture. These farms, they didn't have these villages, they didn't have any electricity, no toilets, it was in the middle of nowhere. But kind of those experiences is what triggered the start of this project back in 2014, 2015. At that point, my wife was here in the Bay Area. I was ready to move here from Microsoft. But this is what I wanted to do. I made a pitch internally, and they gave me a few interns to start with. And that's how this started. So the goal of Farm Beats is to enable data-driven agriculture. So just to put this in perspective, why is this an important problem? The world has a food problem. The world's food production needs to increase by 70% by 2050 to feed the growing population of the world. And it is not just about feeding the population. You need to give them good, nourishing food. And you need to grow this extra food without harming the environment in a sustainable way. The amount of arable land is not increasing. The water levels are going down further. So how do you increase this amount of good food production without hurting the environment? The most promising approach to solve this problem is that of data-driven agriculture. One of the things that data-driven agriculture could do is using that, you can map every farm in the world like this and overlay this with lots and lots of data. For example, what is the soil moisture level six inches below the soil throughout the farm? What's your soil temperature level? What's your soil nutrient level? If you could build maps like this, it could enable techniques like precision agriculture. That is, if you had a map like this, you could apply water only where it is needed, pesticide only where it is needed, nutrients only where it is needed. Precision agriculture as a technique has been shown to improve yield, to reduce cost, you use less water, less pesticide. It's also better for the environment for the same reasons. You're not wasting water, you're not wasting pesticide. Once we started showing the capabilities to build accurate maps like this, we were approached by the seed companies. They are interested in a new technique called phenotyping. That is, just like you could phenotype humans, you can phenotype plants. That is, if you could understand why did the same seed variety grow differently in, say, the yellow versus the green versus the, the red parts of the farm? You can use that to create new seed varieties. That is, you could imagine a future where right now a farmer goes to a retail store, buys a bag of seeds, and applies it throughout the farm. You could envision a future where a farmer, based on the map, goes and buys different bags of seeds, and then the tractor, based on what the farm looks like, would apply the right seed in different parts of the farm. And there are many other scenarios which data-driven agriculture could enable. That is just one scenario with precision agriculture and phenotyping. The thing is, precision agriculture as a technique was proposed back in the 80s. It's been 30 years since then, and the technology still hasn't taken off. And the biggest reason the technology hasn't taken off is the cost of existing data-driven agriculture solutions. So just to put this in perspective, so Chuck was talking about all the schools here, uh, uh, ag schools. UC Davis is another very good ag school, which is based in the region. So at, there was an expo going on in UC Davis. This was a few years back. I was here uh, at the expo. Lots of ag tech companies were presenting the greatest and the best ag tech, the precision ag equipment. And the cheapest sensor package that was available there were five sensors for $8,000 and a recurring cost. For most farmers, what is the ROI? If I put in five sensors, the sensor will only tell me what's happening here. What benefit do I get with that much money? That's the goal of the Farm Beats project. Our goal is to significantly bring down the cost of these data-driven agriculture solutions. 
And I'll talk about a few ways in which we are doing that. Our goal is to get it down for, by two orders of magnitude. That's what we are aiming for. So I'll talk about a few ways in which we address that by solving some of the core problems that are affecting ag tech. So the first reason existing solutions are expensive is because of connectivity. That is, the farmer's house has some sort of connectivity to the cloud. The actual farm is a few miles away. Even though connectivity might exist when you plant the seeds, by the time the crops grow, the connectivity is gone. So then the question is, how are you going to transmit large amounts of data, not just from sensors, but from drones, cameras, tractors, from the middle of the farm to the farmer's house? To solve this problem, we use a technology that I started this, this project at Microsoft, was a technology called TV white spaces. What the TV white spaces enables is, imagine if you had a Wi-Fi router and you could access it a few miles away. That would be cool, right, if you could do that. And the way we did that is we took a Wi-Fi signal and we put it in empty TV channels. This is over-the-air TV, the TV you watch using antennas. You know when you browse through TV on certain channels, you receive a transmission like that. On the other channels, all you see is white noise, nothing coming there. The technology we built was a way to take a Wi-Fi signal and put it in these noisy TV channels in a way that doesn't interfere with your TV reception in an adjacent channel. And the reason this is so cool is that compared to Wi-Fi at the same power level, in UHF TV channels, your signals go four times farther. In VHF, they go 12 times farther, and this is in free space. Once you put in trees, crops, canopies, your signals just keep going through. So with this, what we enabled is you could be watching channel 7 at home. On channel 8, we could be sending these Wi-Fi-like signals. So we have, as I said, we have been doing this for a while. In 2010, the FCC chairman had come, see, to, come to see the demo that we had put together on Microsoft campus. And this was made legal in the US in October of 2010. Since then, we've gone out and connected high schools, hospitals, libraries, dispensaries in various parts of the world using this technology. In fact, two years back, our president, Brad Smith, he announced the Airband Initiative, where Microsoft has made a pledge to connect 3 million rural Americans to broadband by 2022. And the TV white spaces is one of the core enabling technologies based on which we think we can get there. So that through the Airband Initiative, what we are doing is we are creating partnerships. We are investing in ISPs, investing in startups, and, and giving out the technology, the TV white spaces technology I told you about, to bring connectivity to different parts of the world. Sorry. In fact, in the, the key thing in the context of agriculture, by the way, is that TV towers are where people are. You have TV towers in San Francisco, in Seattle. The farms are away from the cities. So if you turn on a TV in the middle of a farm, most of the channels are just white noise. So even if 20 TV channels are available, and I'm being conservative here, in the US there are 50 TV channels. I was giving this talk at an NCGA conference, a National Congress Con Association conference, and a farmer raised a hand and said, well, we only get two channels <laughs> in our house. So most of the channels in the middle of a farm are just white noise. The more empty TV channels there are, the more unused capacity there is. So even if there are 20 TV channels, each channel is six megahertz wide, we are talking of close to half a gigabit per second of available capacity in the middle of a farm. At that point, you're not just talking of connecting sensors. You could be connecting drones, cameras, tractors, streaming a lot of information that you just couldn't get from the middle of the farm. Our vision here is just like you use Wi-Fi to connect your house, you use the TV white spaces to connect your entire farm. You put this antenna in, and miles around it gets connected, streaming a lot of data from the farm. So if you want to check this thing out, you should go, if you go to the Farm Beats website, you'll see a video. So Bill Gates visited the farm that where we've deployed all this stuff. He actually created a blog there uh, Gates, on Gates Notes, and he talks about this technology. And you can see this in action on, on that site. So with the TV white spaces, we can significantly bring down the cost of connectivity in the farm. The second challenge is that of precision mapping. That is, I talked about the vision of creating maps like this. The challenge is, if you had to build an accurate map, say the question was, what is the soil moisture level six inches below the soil throughout the farm? You would need lots and lots of sensors. You would need a sensor every 10 meters because the soil moisture varies from row to row. So then the question was the last bullet here. That is the question we asked was, can we build a map like this using very few sensors? So the way we solved that problem, our key insight, was to use UAVs. These are drones. You can buy them for about $1,000. They have a camera at the bottom, and they can cover large areas very quickly. And the key thing we did was we used artificial intelligence techniques 
to combine ground sensor data with aerial imagery to build very accurate maps of the entire farm. I'll talk about it in a little bit more detail. But while drones are great in the developed world, like in the US, when we, uh, as I said, one of the personal missions is to deploy these technologies in smallholder farms in Africa and India, drones are great here. They don't work that well in places like Africa and India for three key reasons. First, they still cost $1,000, which for most farmers is still quite expensive. Second, they, 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 the battery life of these drones is very poor. That is, most of these commercial drones that you buy would only last 30 to 35 minutes in a single flight. Most of these farms in Africa and India, well, power is not easily accessible in most of these places. And the third concern was kind of unexpected. That is, in some, we went to a country, we wanted to fly a drone, and then we were told that if we had to fly a drone in that country, we had to get permission from the Ministry of Defense. Well, at that point, that wasn't happening. So the question then was, could we come up with another way to get aerial imagery of a farm without using drones? So our solution was to go low-tech. We are using helium-filled balloons. These are about four feet in diameter. To that, what we did was we attached this mount. We built this mount that you're seeing attached to that balloon. This balloon is, at about two, is tethered to the ground, goes up about 200 feet. We built that mount where a farmer, can, what they can do is they can use their smartphone. They can put their smartphone with a camera facing down and a battery pack attached to it. And this thing can stay up from four to seven days taking images of the same part of the farm. So there's this smallholder farmer I, I told you about. This is a farm which is about 25 miles east of Microsoft campus. We do a lot of demos in this farm. So if anyone of you are in the Seattle area, give me a shout out. We'll take you there. So this is a smallholder farmer. This is where we took Bill Gates as well. We do a lot of demos in that farm. So his farm is right next to the river. And every winter, the river floods. Seattle gets a lot of rain. We, the river floods. And his farm right now, because of regulations, he cannot sell any crop that is touched by the flood. Because right now what he does is every morning he comes, he sees, if he sees any amount of water in the farm, any amount of flooding, he'll throw away his entire crop. What we, with this technology, because it can stay up from four to seven days, he has visual proof to see which parts of the farm were actually flooded and only throws away those crops. And in fact, in places like India and Africa, where labor is inexpensive, somebody could just walk around with the balloon, and then we have computer vision algorithms using which you can stitch that together to create these orthomosaics of the entire farm. So then the way the system works, the way we build these heat maps is someone would either fly the drone or the balloon. You would then create these orthomosaics using computer vision techniques. We create a 3D point cloud using which we generate these orthomosaics. Then with the few sparse sensors that are placed in the farm, we use that to train an AI model, a machine learning model, based on which we then predict these values in different parts of the farm. The state of the art, by the way, in sensors is people would put a few sensors, and then the way we, they extrapolate it throughout the entire farm is they'll draw a line, or this, basically if this point is X, this point is Y, you'll draw a line, everything in between is between X and Y. What we did was we applying AI and ML with two key insights. The first is, spatial smoothness. That is, if two parts of the farm are close to each other, they are likely to have similar values. And the second is visual similarity. That is, if two parts of the farm look similar, not just in RGB, but in multispectral or hyperspectral imagery, they are likely to have similar values. And we encoded both of these insights in an AI model, two kernel functions, using which we can start making these predictions. So I'll skip these slides, but I can talk more about the AI model. I'll be hanging around for a few more hours. So if someone's interested, please uh, feel, stop, feel free to chat to me, to, to chat with me. The third thing, I talked about how using the white spaces, you can bring down the cost of connectivity. And using the second AI ML algorithm I talked about, you need much fewer sensors than what you would otherwise need to build these maps of the farm. The third challenge is that of connectivity from the farmer's house to the cloud. That is. Using the TV white spaces, you can bring a lot of data to the farmer's house, but the connectivity from the farmer's house to the cloud is weak. That is, most farmers, they pay for broadband, but all they get is like two to three megabits per second. So the question then is if you get a large amount of data to the farmer's house, but you can't transmit all of this data to the cloud, how will you bring the benefits of all of this data to the farmers? To solve this problem, our key insight was that most farmers have a PC, if they don't have a PC, we ship them a PC form factor device. This sits in the farmer's house or office and does a lot of compute sitting in the farmer's house or office. In fact, this big gray box that you're seeing here 
is running on the PC sitting in the farmer's house. It gets data from sensors, from drones, from cameras. It does deep learning on the edge. It does uh, orthomosaicing, this 3D point, point clouds of the entire farm. And in addition to that, all these agricultural services are also running on the edge device. So I was giving this talk at another event where there was another startup called Slant Range. They came to us and they said, hey, we love the pipeline that you have here. We want to be part of it as well. The interesting thing about this is that all the boxes that you're seeing here are running in Docker containers. So for that startup, we didn't need their source code. All we needed them to do was to put their code in a Docker container, comply with the APIs, and then we could start exposing them as part of this FarmBeats pipeline. So the last one I won't talk much about is power in the farm. So we, of course, there's no power outlets in the middle of a farm, so we use solar panels. We have some intelligent solar panel-driven uh, power optimizations to get the system to last long. One of the interesting things we built there, this was done with, by my intern from Purdue University. So as I mentioned, one of the challenges of using drones is the limited battery life of drones. Most of these drones only last 30 to 35 minutes in a single flight. The question was, how can you get them to last longer? So the way we solved that problem was using wind. That is, you know, when you're sailing, you change the direction of your sails based on which direction you want to go. Same thing, the way you're skiing, you change the direction of your ski, whether you want to accelerate or decelerate. You can do the same thing with drones. That is, based on wind, you can change the yaw of the drone so that you use the, the wind to accelerate and decelerate. And with that, what we showed was when wind was between 5 and 15 miles an hour, we got up to 30% improvement in drone battery life. So this system has been deployed in various parts of the world, uh, including here in Central Valley, California. This is farms of different sizes. We have a farm in eastern Washington, which is 9,000 acres. This is a fifth generation wheat farmer. He's actually using this technology in his farm. These are just some statistics. The one that we are very proud of is the last one. That is, even though there was a week-long outage of internet connectivity, our system continued to run, gathering data from the middle of the farm. One of the things the farmers do with this is microclimate predictions. What we've done is, because these sensors are now low cost, farmers can put quite a few of them in the farm. Now for each sensor, we are predicting what the values of these sensors would be in the future. So you not only see what, for example, the soil moisture is now, you'll see what the soil moisture is going to be over the next five days using these AI models. The way we build these models is we got weather station data from 50 weather stations across Washington state over the last seven years at 15 minute intervals. We use that to train the model and then we do transfer learning to predict these values for the sensors in the farm. The last, uh, the results there, this was actually a quote from the farmer in eastern Washington. The weather forecast was saying that the weather was going to be 42 degrees. He was wondering whether he should be putting, uh, spraying herbicide in his farm. We said that it's going to be 30, uh, 32 de 31 degrees. It actually was 30 degrees, and he, if he would have actually sprayed, pest, uh, sprayed herbicide, the crops would have died. So this was a real use case of AI helping a farmer make more money. This is another use case. This is a four-kilometer stretch in upstate New York. The farmer wanted to know how his cows are doing once they're out in pasture. So we flew the drone. We transmitted the data over the white spaces to an edge device sitting in the farmer's house. And within 30 minutes, we could start flagging things like the grass is growing back well from left to right. There's a water puddle that needs to be fixed before the next planting season. The cows are pooping well, which was also important information for the farmer. This is deep learning on cow poop. <laughs> this is where the cows are. This is a stray cow that needs to be herded in. All of this within 30 minutes of flying the drone. The state of the art is you would fly the drone, you would take the SD card, upload all of this to the cloud, wait for a day before you start getting in, any insights. With the TV white spaces and the edge device, you can start getting these insights in near real time. This is the farm close to Microsoft campus where we do a lot of tours. This is a smallholder farmer who sells his produce in the farmer's market or to restaurants. We show him these beautiful maps. We overlay it with data. For example, in this map, we were able to flag that the bottom left part of the farm is still moist even though we did not have a sensor over there using the sensor fusion technique I talked about. This is after the farmer had applied lime. We were able to flag that the dark parts in that farm are still acidic. The farmer needs to reapply lime before planting the seeds. This is another scenario where we have, uh, could you click play on this? So this is a, actually a barn in the upstate New York farm where we have three cameras, which are, if you could just click play on that video, or it's okay if it doesn't play. So essentially, if you, 
if anyone's interested, you can see is where we have three cameras streaming data over the white spaces to, again, an edge device, where we are seeing how the cows are moving out in the farm. Whether there's any cow that is sick, we can again flag that to the farmer. Here, we essentially compared farm beats with the actual sensor count. So what we showed was, if you had, we collected 1,000 measurement points from three different five-acre plots for soil temperature, soil pH, and soil moisture, and we asked the question, if we use just 10 of these sensor points, how accurately can you predict the remaining 990 points in the farm? In blue is what you're seeing with farm beats. In red is what the actual sensor measured. The key thing to take away from this is that our values are so close to the actual values that they are actionable by the farmer. With very few sensors, you can start building very accurate maps for the farm. So this was all in research, by the way, at Microsoft. I've been doing this since 2015. We got quite a few research accolades. Satya Nadella blogged about it. Uh, Bill Gates blogged about it. Then last year, I transitioned from being in Microsoft Research to product teams as the chief scientist of Azure Global. And we are taking FarmBeats as a product. So the way we are taking it out as a product is as an Azure marketplace offering. So anyone who's using Azure would be able to go to the Azure marketplace and install FarmBeats. What it would do is it would install two resource groups. Everything in green here is what we are building with FarmBeats. Everything in yellow is what we are partnering with other companies on for sensors, for drones, for, uh, for tractor companies, satellite companies, and weather stations. Everything in blue is what is Azure, by the way. So when you install FarmBeats, it will install these two resource groups. Data Hub is this place in the cloud where for any farm, a farm is defined as a polygon, you'll be able to see all the data corresponding to that farm in one place, from sensors, drones, satellites, weather stations, tractors, and so on. And all of those are with partner companies. So we are partnering with sensor companies, drone companies, satellite companies, and so on. In addition to the core data hub, this will also come with the FarmBeats Accelerator, which is source code we'll be licensing out to partners for things like device management, data visualization, as well as sample AI and ML models, like the ones I talked about for sensor placement, for sensor fusion. And Microsoft is not an agriculture company, so we'd be not be selling anything to the growers. The way it would get to the grower is through partners. So we are partnering with ISVs through other big ag companies who will be, again be building solutions on top, which would go to the farmer. So a farmer might never know that they're using farm beats, but behind the scenes, we would be using farm beats. So for the startups out there, this is a great opportunity for both partnering on the data side as well as partnering on the solution side, where you could build solutions on top and take those solutions to the growers, either to the growers or the other big ag companies, all of whom we are working with right now. Yeah, this is the last slide. So what we are doing in FarmBeats is I talked a little bit about the research, things we are doing on the product. In addition, on the societal side, I talked about AI for Earth. We are doing things with Microsoft Philanthropies, where we've connect, we build these FarmBeats student kits, which we are giving out to high schools, based on which these high school chapters, uh, FFA chapters in rural America, they are building the high school curriculum around that. In addition, the one thing I wanted to highlight was that we have an investment arm as well, and we just recently made our first ag tech investment in a company called Turosat. And so we would love to partner with all of you here, VCs as well as startups out there in the audience. And please reach out if you're interested in this sector and you're interested in partnering with us. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Let me hang on to that.